involves a Roman and Vedic in relation to them. In them we find out what love means, what food is for, how precious yet fragile relationships are, how low we can go, how wondrous is God's mercy. They become a touchstone to evaluate all other reality. The other way to think about the triduum is these three days of tradition, you know, is to see them as the whole of reality, to perceive everything we do and everything anyone has ever done is somehow located within these three days, which comprise the full range of animal, vegetable, and material experience, embracing, for example, the rooster that crows, the wine that's poured, and the stone that rolls away. We're going to start, as always, at Great Central Music by singing a uh, hymn together, which you'll find on the inside of the sheet. So if you didn't pick one up on your way in from the little table at the back, now is the perfect moment to correct your mistake. My song is Love Unknown. It's written by the 17th century Dean of Bristol, Samuel Crossman. Poetry perfectly expresses the essence of God's presence with us in Christ in the line love to the loveless shown that they might love in him. Crossman echoes the words of Athanasius, he became what we are, that we might become what he is. Crossman highlights the irony that Jesus is hated for healing people and the crowd choose a murderer rather than the prince of life. In the end, irony, wonder and paradox are all transformed into praise. As Crossman says, this is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. We remain seated, voices stand and lead us as we sing. My song is love. <laughs> Well, the highly observant among you might have noticed on the front of the sheet that the name Bob Chilcott appears no fewer than six times. Full marks for spotting that. 
It's not that we've got the needle stuck, it's that the voices are singing today for us the six hymn settings from Bob Chilcott's setting of the Passion, his St. John's Gospel, an hour-long work telling the story of Christ's trial and crucifixion, which Bob wrote specially for the choir of Wells Cathedral for performance within a cathedral service on Palm Sunday 2013. That must have been quite some service to be present at. It's hard to believe that was only 11 years ago. I, in my humble opinion, for what it's worth, these are his greatest contributions to church music, and it's impossible to imagine Holy Week without them. So we're hearing all six today at Great Sacred Music. We heard one at the beginning, and we're going to hear two more just now. Drop Drop was written by Phineas Fletcher, the 17th century English poet describing three ways water brings us close to God, one through the drowning of our faults and fears, another by our tears through which we lament and cry out to God, a third is by washing one another's feet in obedience to Christ's command, which is of course what makes it a Holy Week hymn. And then we'll hear Jesus you grant me this, which was written by Sir Henry Williams Baker, that very unusual combination of a baronet who was also ordained and it's always rather satisfying for clergy who long for a uh, to be made a knight there are such clergy that it's reverend sir henry not sir reverend henry it's very important the ordination comes ahead of any accolade that the state may possibly bestow on you uh, he, we are chiefly in, in his debt because he was the man that compiled hymns ancient and modern in 1861. The rest is history, and of course he provided quite a lot of the hymns himself. Uh, this came originally from a 17th century Latin text and was written specially for that first edition of hymns ancient and modern in 1861. Let's enjoy Drop Drop, and Jesus, you grant me this now.
Well, if you've enjoyed the three so far, there's good news. There's three more to come. We're going to hear two just now. First of all, there is a Green Hill, which, of course, we have to thank Mrs. C.F. Alexander for. Uh, she did have no children of her own, but she did have godsons, and they complained that the catechism which they were swatting up for confirmation was difficult and boring. So she wrote, wrote a set of verses illustrating the different clauses of the creed for their benefit. And there is a green hill refers to the line in the Apostles' Creed, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Then we're going to hear, were you there in a slightly different mode, familiar as an African-American uh, spiritual uh, but one with a lot of texture to it, because were you there is asking us to reflect whether we could do better than the disciples who, of course, fled from the scene of Jesus' arrest and weren't present for the crucifixion. Uh, were you there places us right at the foot of the cross in the intensity of the action with the, the nails going in, with the spear being thrust and the dice being rolled for the robe, um, but it also connects us with the experience of the slaves who wrote this song, uh, who were there in, in a similar, in an analogous experience to crucifixion in terms of the oppression of slavery. And then finally, there's an, yet another layer going on in this spiritual, a kind of call to mis ministry. Uh, if you think about the parable in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus says, where, wherever you saw me hungry, uh, that, was, that was me. Wherever you were with someone who was thirsty, that was me. Uh, he's basically saying, were you there in those places of, of another's hunger, thirst, and imprisonment? And if you were there, you were with me. So all of those different layers of significance going on in were you there? But first we're going to hear, there is a green help.
again. We're going to sing the hymn on the right hand inside page uh, of your handouts. It was written uh, in the 19th century in Ireland. And all, all of these uh, Passion Tide hymns have a kind of theology of the atonement going on uh, inside them. That's to say of how humanity and God are reconciled, how sin is forgiven, how death is overcome. Uh, and what we're given here by Thomas Kelly is uh, a whole series of uh, renditions of what the cross means. It releases us from guilt, it supports us in weakness, it consoles us in sorrow, it enables us to face death without fear. But the distinctive uh, line in this hymn comes at the beginning of verse 2. Inscribed upon the cross we see in shining letters, God is love. Well, of course, um, that isn't what the, what the uh, Gospels actually say. They say upon the cross it says, I-N-R-I-I, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, with the initials of the Latin for those words. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting theological innovation, and in some ways it's a very appropriate one, and it's, a, it's a, certainly a more congenial doctrine of the atonement than is on offer in many other portrayals. So, inscribed upon the cross we see in shining letters, God is love, not a bad summary of Good Friday. We remain seated, and the voices stand and lead us as we sing the, we sing the praise of him who died. Well, we're coming towards the end of Great Sacred Music for today, for this Holy Week. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. 
Uh, if you have, there's an opportunity to part with all your worldly wealth at the door, either with a card, just a, just a s simple swipe, um, or in, in cash in the old-fashioned way, and there are various ways to contribute online which will be available to you if you're joining us from afar. Next, uh, on, on Sunday, our sister program, Choral Classics, will be uh, celebrating this joyful Easter tide and the theme, surprise, surprise, next Thursday here will be Easter. We're going to finish with When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, perhaps the best known of all the Holy Week Passion Tide hymns. It's got a particular angle on the atonement. It's very much backs what's known as the moral influence theory. Uh, which means, in brief, that when uh, we, we behold Jesus on the cross, our hearts are transformed, sometimes called a subjective theory of the atonement, because it's more about what happens to us than it happens, uh, than what happens either to Jesus or in relation to God. Uh, and you might spot as we sing this that the words me, my, and I occur 12 times in 16 lines, so it's very much about me. Uh, one of the most poignant lines is, did air such love and sorrow meet? Possibly the most memorable line in the whole hymn. The cross is the very extreme of sorrow, but also the very extreme of love. Christianity is the recognition that true love must face untold sorrow if it's to be embodied in everlasting companionship. Thanks for joining us.